on, good afternoon guys. Welcome to MK Community Brokerage. My name is Mohammed. In this video, we're gonna go over some practice exam questions for the New York State real estate exam. Now, these questions are basically not the ones you're gonna see, obviously, but we try our best to make sure you're gonna get somewhat similar questions like these. And anyone tells you that these are the same questions they tell you that you saw in the real estate exam is illegal. So these questions, we're trying to get what's the closest possible for you to take the real estate exam, what we're trying to pinpoint exactly this is the type of question they might ask. So we're gonna go over with multiple parts of the exam. There's a lot of questions, we're gonna have different parts of the videos. So we're gonna do 25 questions for one part, then we're gonna do 25 questions for the second part, and so forth word. So with all of you, let's begin. So for those of you that are interested in a real estate career, real estate is one of the most beautiful careers that you can start off with. You learn a lot about laws, contract laws, um, laws regarding to um, you know regarding to the New York State laws, HIPAA laws, and so forth. Board. So you'll learn a lot in the New York State real estate exam. So it's a lot of a lot of information that you get. You know, you need to learn how to you know what the house is made of. You need to learn what 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 do you do when 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 you have to do a closing. Uh, you know, different types of homes like condos, co-ops and you know renters and this and that what type of rights a, a tenant has what type of rights the landlord has you know what to do in a situation when you when you when you, when you, when you when you're dealing with a landlord and and you know into some stuff like that so you, it's it's an interesting interesting career and an interesting work that you'll do um, real estate usually you're an independent contractor meaning that you're by yourself um, you meaning that you're working for a company you're getting a 1099 from them um, you're you know you're self-employed basically put it like that and and, and put it in perspective so it's it's all obviously we'll talk more about this later on but I just wanted to give you the questions and what are the most common questions they might ask you during the real estate exam so I'm what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna read the questions obviously you see the answers on the bottom we're just gonna go over some of the questions what, may, what might be more difficult than the other ones which might be need more better understanding we'll go over with that so question one under no circumstances may a broker the answer is C mispresent material facts so you do receive a commission from both the buyer and seller. Yes, you do. You do receive a commission. You could appoint a sub-agent, but you cannot mispresent material facts. You cannot do that. You can't tell uh, uh, if if I'm a seller and a buyer comes in, I cannot lie to the buyer and tell them like there's no reeking roofs or nothing like that. I have to be honest as possible. So basically, that's what it is. You cannot mispresent any type of material facts of the house or anything related to it. You have of honesty and integrity to give to the other person vice versa same goes for the seller same exact thing question two when the real estate broker puts a buyer deposit check in his personal account and then writes a check against it to pay his electric bill which violation has been committed the answer is both d commingling and conversion once you do that you're com you're you're committing yourself with commingling and conversion Commingling means you're just make, mixing up money with here and there. And conversion, you just, obviously, you converted from what you were supposed to do with something else. So they're both in violation of the New York State real estate law. So be careful when we get asked a question like this. Three, a borrower who expects to remain in a property for many years and most likely prefer, the answer for this is B, to pay an overall low interest rate and a higher loan origination fee. That's the honest truth. You know, if you're gonna remain on a property for more, more, more likely, you know, like for more than years to come, you probably want a lower interest rate, like three percent, two percent, and a higher loan origination fee, because you obviously gonna be paying the house little by little. So you don't, you know, you don't want too much of a burden with the high, with the higher interest rate and everything. Value levels in a residential neighborhood are influenced more by social characteristic of its present and prospective occupants than by any other factors. What would remain high values in a given neighborhood? The answer for this is C. Everybody purchasing, purchasing with comparable down payments and everybody having approximately same income level. That's the only difference with value level in residential neighborhood. Obviously, there's other factors that are also in fact, such as, you know, like sometimes when you go to a neighborhood, when your house is worth 400000 with a bunch of houses worth a million dollars, your value of your house might go up due to the other values of the other houses close to you. So keep that in mind. A real estate salesperson does not have to check and do not uh, uh, the check that do not call registry when making a solicitation call with D of the above. If you're a commercial number, you don't have to do that. In response to an inquiry made within three months, 
And if there is an existing business relationship within 18 months, you don't need to do the do not call check registry. Because think about it, if you have a client relationship with somebody, you're calling them and asking them additional questions, you technically do not have to be in the do not call registry because you already know the person. So basically, same goes for this one. So if you know the person, you have a relationship, you, you know, you just made, that person made an inquiry, whatever the case is, and you know, you don't have to be. If any of them are not there, then it has to be in the do not call registry. Which law prevents a real estate agent from receiving a referral fee from an escrow or the company? The answer is C, RESPA. RESPA basically states that you cannot receive a referral fee from an escrow or title company. Referral fee is basically like kind of like kickbacks. You're getting money from the company and saying that, you know what, if, if you do this, then I'll, I'll give you this. You might not, know, not even know that person, that one that you're referring to. You just know, you just, you just find out that the person's name is Jonathan. So guess what? Now you, you're, you're just referring somebody you don't even know and you're giving to your customers. Basically, that's what, 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 what basically it is. RESPA makes sure that it doesn't allow that to happen to any of the customers. There are certain requirements that must be met before a transaction that can be placed in escrow. They are, the answer is D. So in order to make a requirement to be placed in escrow, there's certain things that has to be met. A binding contract between a buyer and seller, that has to be it. A neutral third party is employed, basically the bank. A condition delivery of all documents related to sale. This is something that has to be met before any type of transaction can be placed in escrow. It's very, very, if you are a home buyer or you're process buying a homeowner, uh, you know, home and stuff in the future, keep that in mind, it has to be done from that. Five people hold undivided interest as tenants in common, which is always true. The answer is C. Each cannot identify the respective parts of the property. So, tenants in common, which I'll go in the other video in the future, are something that they're, they're commonly involved in one specific house. And they cannot identify their respective part of the, uh, they cannot identify, remember that, they cannot identify their respective part of the property due to being tenants in common. There's other tenants as well, the other rules as well, you know, uh, to, uh, joint tenancy and stuff like that, but we'll go over it in another video. But with tenants in common, you cannot identify which part of your respective part of your property. In a loan covering two properties would best be described as, uh, the answer is blanket loan. So blanket loan usually covers with, if you have multiple properties, um, you know, like the, it's kind of like, put like a blanket, you know, it covers up everything, it's like one loan. So basically that's the only option that you'll be able to do. There's open end loan, gap loan, and wraparound loan. We'll talk about that in the future and what they are, but that's, that's how it is. But for, for just quick references, uh, basically an open ended loan is like such as a credit card, repair type of stuff that you you need to use. Uh, gap loan requires a property while still waiting for a sale of another. That's what the gap loan is. If you're requiring a property, sale of another. Um, so basically that's what I use for o o gap loan and everything. So there's different types of loan and everything that you might need to use. But for this, pro for this question, it's gonna be a blanket loan. Despite the fact that the broker had a va valid listing, the seller found the buyer. The broker did not earn a commission. What kind of listing is this most likely? This is going to be exclusive agency listing. This is basically seller will be liable to pay. So this one, only seller gets commission. Basically, exclusive agency listing. Because when you put up exclusive agency listing, you're basically saying that I'm the broker and uh, I'm going to be the getting the, the person. Basically, you don't have to, even though the fact the seller found the buyer, the broker the broker did not earn the commission, the exclusive agency listing is basically you're not going to get the commission. Exclusive right to sell listing is basically the seller will be liable to pay commission to the broker, but exclusive agency listing, you're not. So if, so basically is that, that's how it is. If you, in the exclusive agency listing, if you do not get a buyer, only seller gets the commission. Basically, like if you, if the seller ends up getting the buyer, you're not getting anything. Now, exclusive right to sell listing is once you get the buyer, basically as a broker, if you get, even if the seller gets the buyer, you're still gonna get the commission, regardless who gets it, who, however you get the customer, you're gonna get it. So just keep that in mind. If you do the exclusive late agency listing, you're not gonna get that. Which of the following is smaller than a section? Well, this is something you have to know. It's kind of like memorization, so keep that in mind. The answer for this is going to be C, 27,000 square feet. 2,700,000, should I say, square feet. When selling a reasonable price, well-established home in a classy suburban neighborhood, the broker would probably gain the most interest in, the answer is going to be what? A, prestige. 
Because you think about it, you're selling a house in a, if you're selling a reasonable price house in an established suburban neighborhood, obviously you want to know the prestige. The house value goes up. It's stuff like that. So keep that in mind. You know, when you have prestige, it's not tax advantage. It's not an investment. It's not a need. Prestige is something that you have. If you if you're selling uh, in a, in a neighborhood with with houses that are worth one million dollars, your house is gonna have prestige. You you know, you're gonna look out out of the ordinary. So keep that in mind. When selling a reasonable priced, when selling a reasonable priced, well established home, in the, oh, that's what we did, which is not a required to be disclosed under the Truth in Lending Law. So, the answer for this is going to be what do you think it is? Obviously, the answer is here. D. Total finance charge in purchase of a single family home owner occupied dwelling. This is something that is not required to be disclosed under the Truth in Lending Law. In, in Lending Law. So, annual percentage rate, length of loan, monthly payment. It could be disclosed, but not total finance charge in purchasing of a single family owner occupied dwelling. That doesn't have to be disclosed under the, it is not, which is not required to be disclosed under the Truth in Lending Law. A property is owned by five persons in joint tenancy. Which of the following action would destroy the respective tenancy relationship? The answer is D. If the lender completes a foreclosure against a joint tenant, issuing a trustee deed to the highest bidder. That's the only way, that's one of the ways you could put it, which will destroy the respective tenancy relationship if you do that. The other option does not relate to this. A buyer for a low price home without a down payment is most likely to qualify for a, what answer will be? It's going to be an A, VA loan. So if you're if you're a buyer with a home price with a low price home without a down payment, you're most likely going to be qualifying for a VA loan. Convention loans, not conforming loans, or preferred loans are not going to be it, but VA loans will be part of it if you are trying to to basically do that. Um, a convention loan is basically mortgage does not need to be backed up by private banks. It's kind of like a private company. Let's put it like that. And portfolio loans for people with low credit score, but it's flexible. If you if you have low credit score, portfolio loan is gonna be non-conforming loan. Is again, it's like a loan where uh, again, it's like something where banks are not really regulated. But that's what non-conforming loan is. A convertible AR, ARM means that the loan, its answer is B, may be converted to a fixed rate loan. That's what convertible ARM, ARM means. It's a fixed rate loan. The danger associated with the adjustable rate loan is that the answer is C. Both the interest rate could increase to the cap and payment could increase. That's the answer for this one. D. Oh, I'm sorry. The IRS will treat the real estate salesperson as an independent contractor if three criteria are met. These criteria include the answer is D. All of the above. The salesperson must be a licensed as a real estate agent. Obviously, you need to be a licensed real estate agent. B. Reimbursement to the salesperson must be solely based on sales, not on hours worked, because you're obviously an independent contractor. C. There is a written contract that states that salesperson shall be treated as an independent contractor for tax purposes. Again, when you're working at a private, uh, not private, but you could put like you're working for a place such as uh, other, uh, you know, like uh, real estate a a places, you're basically an independent contractor. You're not working on the books. You're not getting anything else. You're getting a 1099. And uh, you are an employee, but you're an independent contractor. You're basically filing your taxes at the end of the year as an independent contractor, but you are employed by them. When an appraiser is concerned about equilibrium and decline, he's working with which of the following principles? The answer is C, principle of change. An easement held by a power company for erecting poles and lines are required as an easement of, the answer is C, ingross. So in gross easement, you basically means that you're going over somebody else's property to do some, uh, you know, like usually the the books and textbook will always use this example by easement by by you know like gross by when the power companies are erecting poles and are required in another property or something. But that's what it is. Easement by in gross or in gross, you put it like that is used when you're doing stuff in another property. You have permission basically to do that. You wish to purchase a two acres of property for which you will pay $1.30 per square foot. The purchase price will be, the answer is C, $98,445.60. If a railroad company describes to build additional lines across property it did not own or have interest in, and the owners were not interested in selling, what course of action would the railroad company most likely take? The answer is D, eminent domain. So, 
if a railroad company, right, it wants to build some type of property it did not own or have interest in, and the owners are not interested in selling, the government can do eminent domain. Eminent domain is something that the government is saying that, you know what, I, I'm going to take over this, and uh, I'm going to try to have my, uh, you know, like, uh, do this for the purpose of whatever purpose it is, like, as a railroad company. So eminent domain is like a kind of like for government saying that I'm going to take over, here's the money, I'm going to be taking it. Now, if you don't want to do it, it's called reverse condemnation. So that you say, no, no, no way. I'm not going to do that. So you appeal it, basically, in reverse condemnation, saying that I'm not going to do it and everything. This is not it. Or they offer you less prize. You want more money. Like, oh, you know what? My house is worth triple the money now since you want to build a railroad. In appraising a house, the, sh the, sh the shape design of a residence would affect the appraisal estimate in regards to, the answer is C. I mean, I'm sorry, B, replacement cost. Now, a lot of times in, in a home, most mortgage brokers want the house to be insured for replacement costs, especially when, when you're buying a new house, not actual cash value, replacement costs. Replacement costs is the amount of money it's going to take to replace the house, like the stuff inside the house, structures, and everything else. So replacement costs is something that they'll look for. So keep that in mind for the for future. If an agent advertises a property for sale in an intent classified website but does not mention he's a licensed agent, what kind of ad has he created? The answer is going to be blind ad. Because that person did not mention everything in the ad, it's going to be a blind ad for that matters. And word of thought, if you have not heard of a name before, pretty, pretty much, if there's a chance that that's, that if you never heard of a name, do not pick something. In the, especially in the exam because if you know if you haven't heard of something that most likely they're just making that up just to confuse you and throw you off guard but obviously the names you're familiar you heard of it there's most likely a chance that's something that's going to be there at least for a definite time period would be an a state for years a state for years are at least with a definite time period that means that you'll have a time um, for whatever it is Periodic tenancy is tenancy continuing for a specific period until the tenancy gives the landlord a fixed time. That's what periodic tenancy for years. Obviously, a state of suffrage is basically a deadbeat tenant. That's, uh, for example, like the tenant's living there and they said that, you know what, I don't want to leave now. Guess what? That's what a state of sufferance is. Now the landlord is suffering. It's in the location, the tenant doesn't leave, now you're suffering. Just how I remember that. A state, uh, again, a state for years is something that the tenant leaves for a period, uh, a specific period of time, for January 2021 to January 2022. Periodic tenancy, you can put it like in your mind, like month to month. You know, the tenancy continues for a specific period of time under the tenancy give the landlord, I'm like, I'm out now. Basically, that's what it is. A state of will, again, is something that is usually deals with, with will, like, you know, you have a will and everything like that. I'm, I'm, I'm here till, until I die or stuff like that, but these are the three main ones. The theory of adverse possession will best match up with, the answer is D, prescription. We're going to finish, this is going to be the last ones we're going to finish in this page, and then we're going to do with part two as well. The parcel of land of 500 feet times 300 feet is bisected into two equal sized rectangles by a row of eucalyptus trees. How many acres are there in each portion? Well, the answer is this, it's going to be B, 1.72. A lease agreement for written for a definite period of time with prescribed payment condition is the answer is B personal property for land value of an area are well known and much data available from recent lot sales which method of appraising property in that area will be most likely used the answer for this is going to be land residential straight line that's the one you're going to be using and the last question before we go to part two a verbal acceptance of an offer for the purchase of real estate with a broker would constitute contract that was? The answer is C, unforeseeable. So for, oh, I'm sorry, the answer is D, enforceable. So a verbal acceptance of an offer for the purchase of real property with a broker would constitute contract that is enforceable because you have a verbal acceptance for the purchase for the real estate with another person, your contract is going to be enforceable, not unenforceable. There's a statute of fraud that requires a real estate contract to be written. However, there is, if the contract fails to comply, it's not void, it's just unforce, unenforceable. So it's going to be C, unenforceable. So we're going to leave it like that for now. Um, we're going to start with part two later on. Again, if you guys have any questions that you're confused on this, you can always give me a quick chat. I'll try to explain as much as possible uh, and, you know, to do that. 
Um, I know some of these questions are kind of confusing, and the way I'm explaining it might be a little bit confusing as well. It's it, This is just kind of like a quick refresher. I'll have other videos of going each of the definitions, which will probably be better off if you watch those videos first and then go over here, because at least you'll know what the definition is, and you'll get a better understanding what the answer is what. So we'll leave it at that for now. Um, thank you again for watching this video. If you guys have any other questions, comment, concern, please comment, like, subscribe. I'll try my best to help you as much as possible to clarify any confusion you guys have. Thank you again, guys, for watching this video. Hopefully you guys enjoy it.